when you read an article about brain research, usually you see some condition leads to activation in some part of the brain. This kind of result is called an association. That is, given condition X, region Y in the brain was activated. This is why many publications begin with the title, the neural correlates of, followed by whatever they were studying. These kinds of experiments can be interesting, but if we only focus on associations, we are limited in what we can say about the functional architecture of the brain. Instead, we can use something called forward inference to establish dissociations. That is, we design our experiment so that only one of the conditions activates a given region and not the other conditions. One of the most famous examples of a dissociation was the patient H.M., who had large sections of his hippocampus removed. After the procedure, he was still able to recall long-term memories from before the surgery, but was unable to form new episodic memories afterwards, which suggests that the hippocampus is necessary for the formation of new memories, but not for the retention of memories that have already been formed. Going one step further, lesion studies of Broca's area and Wernicke's area have revealed a double dissociation. In this case, damage to Broca's area results in non-fluent aphasia, that is the inability or extreme difficulty to speak or write. Damage to Wernicke's area, on the other hand, leads to fluent aphasia, in which the patient is able to speak and write, but in a disordered, random manner. This has led neuroscientists to conclude that these areas are responsible for distinct functions, generating versus comprehending language. Even without lesion studies, though, we can still establish dissociations using functional neuroimaging. According to Richard Henson's 2006 paper, this is best done through measuring qualitative or significant differences. In this figure, we see that simply finding a quantitative difference in the bold response between two conditions does not, in itself, suggest that this region is selective for condition A and not for condition B. A stronger test would be to compare them directly using a paired samples t-test. And to further bolster your claim about selectivity, you should select a control region and run the same tests. If you find the opposite pattern in the other region, this is evidence of a double dissociation. The finding that two regions show qualitatively different patterns of activity. Lastly, a significant region-by-condition interaction provides further statistical evidence for a dissociation. For example, let's look at an fMRI study of remembering versus knowing words that were presented earlier in the experiment. Words were remembered if the subject could recall details about when they saw the word. On the other hand, words were known if they seemed familiar, but the subject couldn't recall any specific details about when they saw it. Henson and colleagues found significantly greater activation in the posterior cingulate for remembered words, but not known words, and greater activity in the lateral prefrontal cortex for known words compared to remembered words, along with a significant region by condition interaction. As a control condition, new words were also presented, which showed no significant activity in either region. Another example comes from my own research about the dissociation of cognitive and pain effects in the medial prefrontal cortex. Using independent ROIs created from Neurosynth, from the search terms pain, conflict, and prediction error, Parameter estimates were extracted for the pain, conflict, and prediction error conditions in the experiment. The more ventral ROI showed a significant effect of pain, but not for the cognitive effects, while there was an opposite pattern of activity in the more dorsal ROIs. The condition-by-region interaction was also significant, lending support to the hypothesis 
that there is a doubled association between pain being associated with activity in the dorsal cingulate cortex, which lies below the cingulate sulcus, and cognitive effects associated with activity in the pre-supplementary motor area, which sits above the cingulate sulcus. To summarize, in order to claim that a doubled association exists, your data should meet the following criteria. 1. Within region R1, there is a significant positive effect of condition A, but not of condition B. 2. Within region R2, there is a significant positive effect of condition B, but not of condition A. 3. Within region R1, condition A is significantly greater than condition B. 4. Within region R2, condition B is significantly greater than condition A. And 5. There is a significant region by condition interaction term. Other methods are also becoming popular for outlining the functional architecture of the brain. For example, transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, temporarily disrupts neural activity in what can be thought of as a virtual, temporary, reversible lesion, which allows us to make claims about what part of the cortex is responsible for certain types of perception and cognitive processes. I hope this gives you a good conceptual overview of doubled associations, why they're useful, and how you can do them on your own. All you need is data from two conditions and two regions. And if you need a refresher on how to do a region of interest analysis, there are links down below. Lastly, although I gave you criteria for a doubled association, these are not absolute rules. You may meet all of the criteria except for one which is marginally significant, but it can still point towards a trend of a dissociation, which can still be useful. Furthermore, you may be interested in the effect sizes and not just the statistical significance. We'll talk more about significance versus effect sizes in the next video.